It's interesting. I talk to some women that say, well, men just use their money to lord over them. And in response, I'm like, I don't see any garbage collectors or taxi cab drivers or any of that where they do that. They do that in order to, to have or to keep their marriages or, mm -hmm. or to get a girlfriend. Yes. That's why they do it. It's not to lord money over you. Mm. And as a man, I hear that and I'm affronted with this construct of that. I have to work super hard to get one and to keep one. Yes. I, I mean, that, that's my own inner disposability. And so, yes, what happens with, um, when, you, when you look at the fact that men who don't, who, uh, men who aren't married and don't plan to be married, uh, that they earn less than women do. Women who have never been married and never have children earn 117% of what men who have never been married and never have children earn. Then you start asking the question, well, why is that? So men are not just inherently oriented toward wanting to earn more money. There must be, because when they don't plan to be married, they actually earn less. So what is the process that leads to men earning more? And I think maybe a good example of that, um, that my first insight into that uh, came when Gloria Steinem and I were about ready to do AM New York. And so we're, we get into a cab and we're talking about this issue and the cab driver overhears us and hears that we're going to a TV station. And he says, are you guys talking about this issue on TV? And the issue was that men have the power and women don't. Men had privilege and women don't. And this is the the years be that I was just beginning to question this, but I was not articulating it. And the cab driver sort of did long pause and he goes, um, well, you know, would you want to guess how many hours per week I drive a cab? And he goes, we go maybe 40-ish or so. He <laughs>, laughs at us and he goes, like try 60 to 70. And I'm just the average cab driver driving 60 to 70 hours a week. Do you think I do this to have power? Um, you know, or did you call it privilege? Um, I, I, I do this, so why do, you, why do you think I do this? And we go, I guess, to maybe uh, provide for your family. And he goes, I do this so my kids will not have to do this. Um, I do this so my wife has a good home, yes. But I do the good home thing because I want us to live in a decent school district so my kids have good schools to go to so they don't have to drive cabs when they get older. Because at the um, heart of male disposability is we love others way more than we love ourselves as men. So the thing about male disposability is that, like the cab driver, we don't, men are not patriarchal to lord over. It's male disposability. It's we love others, we love our families and our wives, our children, more than ourselves, way more. And we face a world where we're told that we're patriarchal, we're evil, and we do this to lord over people. Yeah, so let's take, a, let's take apart this whole concept of patriarchy. One of the, the shadow side of the women's movement was saying that we live in a patriarchal world um, in which men made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. Now this is, one, this is feminism 101 in every gender studies course in the, in the world, that, um, in, which is mostly in developed nations. And so we have to take that apart. And the, we don't live in a world dominated by patriarchy. We live in a world dominated by the need to survive. And to, and to survive, our mothers were required, are expected and pressured to risk their lives in childbirth um, and, and spend their lives devoted to raising those children, at, uh, often at the risk of their own lives. And so that the feminist movement got but it framed that portion of women's, women's role as discrimination against women. What the feminist movement missed was the other half of that. And the other half of that was dads were expected to be willing to be disposable in war to protect the children that women bore so that we wouldn't have to be under Nazi rule. And we get, but we gave men social bribes to say, you'll be a hero if you die in war and if you, you know, dress as a Marine and you go off like dad did and you, and you fight in the infantry. And if you die, uh, we, will, we will say you served your country well. And so the, the little boy grew up saying, I can be a hero. I can stand out. I can be worth 
I can be worthwhile, I can be worth something. And oftentimes before he went off to war, he got married so that if he was killed, the wife would have the benefits of the, uh, the benefits from his pension and so on. So nobody said to, to, their, to, my, to their sons, son, you're a male, your job is to be disposable. That completely missed, that concept of disposability completely missed all of us. Uh, what, we, what we learned was we're gonna be a hero by being willing to die in war. And then when we came home from war, we would do whatever we needed to do to earn money uh, that often somebody else would spend while we again died sooner in the coal mine or in the uh, oil rig or so on. And that was another part of our disposability. So we learned that we would be disposable in war or disposable in work without the word disposable ever being used, therefore opening up by our not articulating the potential for disposability, opening up the door for feminism to think that the extra money that men earn to be willing to be that coal miner, that truck driver, or that CEO and work 70, 80 hours a week and, and, and go wherever the company wanted him to go in order to become that CEO, um, to, to think of that as male privilege and male power as opposed to the male form of dis discrimination. If you're going to call women's role discrimination, which was the wrong thing to do, it was not discrimination, it was a role. But if you're going to call that discrimination, you have to call the flip side of that discrimination also. The discrimination against men was the expectation and the pressure to earn more money. Yes. So the feminist movement took the outcome of earning more money and called it privilege and power for men and a conspiracy on the part of this patriarchy to design rules that benefited us and not, and not women and missed completely the fact that, that from a male point of view, that was the pr pressure and obligation is not about privilege and power. No one who feels pressured and obligated to do something feels privileged and powerful doing it. Power is about the ability to determine our own lives. What the women's movement has done is given power to women by saying, you, if, we have ch if you have children, you have three options. Option one is to be full-time involved with the children. Option two is to be full-time involved with the workplace. Option three is to do some combination of both in whatever order you wanna do them. And, option, and you guys, you have three options too. Option one is to work full-time. Option two is to be, oh, to work full-time. And option three is to work full-time. We have to work full-time. Uh, or if you're a working class man, work two jobs, or if you're a um, upper class man, work uh, overtime. And for the feminist movement to call that discrimination in favor of men, as opposed to calling that discrimination against men, or the male role that helped us survive, and thank you for being the garbage collector, thank you for, you know, for being away, moving wherever you needed to move to, to to benefit the family and thank you for working um, overtime and, to, and doing psychological take-home work of working in the evenings and working weekends when you would have preferred to be with children. That is, you know, please thank you for taking that role uh, and we would like to share that burden with you and I'd like you to share the burden of raising children with us. And that what is the male response to that? The Pew Research Center for the first time in history asked full-time working men whether they would prefer to be full-time with working or full-time with the children. And 40, to their astonishment, 49% of full-time working men, so this is not men unemployed um, at home, full-time working men said that they would prefer to be full-time with the children, except they couldn't be because they needed to earn the money. Correct. Um, and so for half of men, this is, a full, this is an unarticulated, unsympathized with discrimination against men in which the word discrimination against men is never used as it is with women playing their role. And men need to stand up and have the courage to say this. Um, and men say to me, well, if I say this in any mixed group, I'm going to just be knocked. I'm not, I'm not going to be popular. You're not going to be popular. They're going to be ostracized. Because, but let me challenge yes. that for a second. Because what I say to, because I was on the board of now, and uh, on the board of now, a lot of women spoke up and knew that, that when they spoke up, they were going to be thought as, uh, of as hating men. And they spoke up nevertheless. They had the courage to do that. And we guys, we have to take responsibility. We can't, you know, as, as the title of one of my books, I've felt so strongly about this, I titled one of my books, Women Can't Hear What Men Don't Say. It is our time for the first time in human history. We've been speaking up about a lot of things like getting higher wages, but all the things we've been speaking up about are things that let the higher wages protected our, our families. 
We were willing to speak up about the things that protected others, but we're not willing to speak up about the things that protected ourselves because we've always learned that any man who complains about something that affects him is a whiner and a complainer. And women don't fall in love with whining men, they fall in love with alpha men. And we wanted to be the, the man that a woman fell in love with. And I'll, I'll give a really good example, I think, of this, which is buck elks. Uh, first of all, understand that about in almost all species, about 85% of reproduction occurs um, from a, a woman with the alpha male in that species. Buck elks are one of those species that does that. So the females fall in love with the alpha male. The alpha male is the male that, that grows the biggest antlers. To be the biggest antler growing among the buck elks, about 30 to 35% of your calcium and nutrients are, and minerals are used up. So you actually are the weakest of the buck elks, but you appear to be the strongest. If the buck elk does not get rid of its antlers immediately after mating period, it risks dying if the winter comes before it replenishes all those nutrients. So this is a really good example, I believe, of men's weakness being our facade of strength. And it's the facade from everybody. The male himself thinks he's the strongest when in fact he's the weakest. And the male who is, dies at war, as a, he becomes a general. Every time he risks his life at war, he gets promoted. He gets social bribes and promoted to be disposable. Yeah. And he thinks of me, I am the head of you know, the, my pack. And what are you? You are the person who's been most vulnerable to the bribe, the social bribes for male disposability. What we need is every part of the male-female movement to be willing to represent the feminist perspective and more conservative women's perspectives, liberal men's perspectives, and more, more conservative men's perspectives. No movement on gender can be a balanced, loving movement unless it represents all four of those perspectives. What we have done to this point in history is take a magnifying glass to women's experience of powerlessness and women's experience of male power. But no one has taken a magnifying glass to the male experience of powerlessness and the male experience of female power.